the rim. Imagine going through life being able to tell everybody that you were drafted before Kobe Bryant, or, or better yet, that you were the guy drafted right before Kobe Bryant. Honestly, depending on who you are, depending on how your career turned out, that may or may not be something you want to keep a secret. But regardless, that's a preference 12 former NBA players have to decide on because that's how many were drafted before him in 1996. And with that being the case, out of every draft retrospective video that you've seen on this channel so far, you probably can't even fathom how that happened. Kobe was beating professional players in pickup games as a teenager, had one of the best workouts ever according to Jerry West, and his work ethic was clearly unrivaled. So how in the world did 11 franchises just turn their heads with him on the board? How did one franchise get coerced into trading him? And what became of the players' careers who were drafted before him? Questions that might have confusing answers, like the one as to why you haven't downloaded the Raid app yet. So, for one second, forget everything you think you know about mobile games because one of the most ambitious RPG projects of 2019 has just been released, and it's gonna change everything. This is Raid Shadow Legends, and Raid is the most immersive experience you're gonna find on your smartphone, as it's really more comparable to PC or console titles. But the best part? It's completely free. Raid has all the features you'd expect from a brand new RPG like amazing storylines, 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of characters called champions to collect and customize. And when looking at how well this game performs, keep in mind that it is a mobile game. Look at the crazy amount of detail on these champions. Raid is growing at an insane rate, so make sure you get in early because starting now will give you a huge head start. There's also an upcoming special launch tournament with crazy in-game prizes and real-life physical prize packs. And be sure to join my clan before that. Just search for Dom2K. So if you're interested in downloading this app, make sure to go through my links in the comment section and the description and get 50,000 silver immediately and a free epic champion as a part of the new player program courtesy of the dev team. Hope to see you there. Alright, so starting from the top, why one of the greatest, most work-obsessed players ever wound up falling to 13th in the NBA draft? Well, that one's pretty easy actually. See, in 1996, the NBA was not too keen on taking players straight out of high school. As a matter of fact, to that point in time, there were only four players that had ever made that jump and they were all big men. Franchises just weren't trying to risk betting on a kid. So despite Kobe's obvious talent, most teams that year were far more content to go with a guy that had a nice body of work in college, just someone that had proven themselves at a higher level. Even the Hornets coach at the time, Dave Cowens, said, quote, we don't take high school kids. Also, that draft featured what was known as the Super Six of 96, meaning there were six players you absolutely could not go wrong by drafting. They'd all went to college, so, that all but completely scared off teams from going the Kobe route. Next are the important details because for a while there's been these rumors floating around that Kobe himself forced a trade to the Lakers and that's just not as accurate as saying his agent forced the trade. Kobe worked out for multiple teams including the Philadelphia 76ers and he did good enough that the actual staff wanted to draft him or at least find a way to move Jerry Stackhouse to get the pick to pair him with Iverson. However, the guys calling the shots weren't sold on the move so there goes an epic storyline of Kobe and Iverson trying to coexist with one basketball. The next team that was set to take him was the New Jersey Nets with the 8th pick, and they were totally sold. Kobe's camp was cool with the idea, until Jerry West entered the picture. West saw Kobe's workout firsthand and watched him dominate Mississippi State's Dante Jones who had been the MVP of the NCAA tournament Southeastern's regional during that spring. All of that was enough to convince West that he was going to move heaven and earth to get him in the draft. Moving heaven and earth for him meant convincing other teams GMs that he had no interest in Bryant and having Bryant's agent convince the Nets that Kobe would absolutely not play for them if he was drafted there. He went as far as to threaten to have him play for the Italian League. So with the combined power of apathy towards high school players, Jerry West faking out the opposition one more time, and Kobe's agent playing along, that gives you the basic idea of how he fell to 13th when he otherwise would have been 8th at worst. But that's not saving anybody today. Now we're going to take a brief look at the careers of every player taken before him and just how hard each franchise should be crying over their self-inflicted wounds. So of course at the number one spot, the Sixers took Iverson as planned. And there were just a ton of factors at play there. Pat Croce was a huge fan, Iverson's potential was clear, and they just weren't going to gamble anything away for Kobe. 
There was also the idea that Bryant was from that area, and many, many years earlier, his father Joe Bryant folded partly due to the pressure of playing for his hometown's professional team. So all things considered, Philly would be taking on way too much risk in that situation when they could just go with the safe bet in Iverson. And this wasn't a terrible thing for the Sixers to have done either. Iverson came in and immediately showed his impact unlike Kobe, and five years later, they were hitching a ride with him to the NBA Finals against Kobe and Shaq. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, the Sixers losing that finals was less about them not having Kobe and more about them just not having a dynasty-wielding dynamic duo to counter them with. So Kobe won his second ring that year at the expense of the team that passed to even trade for him, and Iverson's career was pretty much downhill from there. It took the Sixers threatening to trade him before the 2001 season to even light the fire that led to him winning the MVP that year, and overall, he was worth about as many headaches for the franchise as he was successful moments, if not more. I suggest you watch my previous video about Iverson because it explains in much more depth than I have time to give here exactly everything that went wrong in his time with Philly. But anyways, shortly after he and Larry Brown could finally no longer exist, Iverson was traded to the Nuggets for an underwhelming season and a half. He and Melo sounded awesome on paper, but a lot of the extracurricular activity that ruined his time in Philly followed him right to Denver, and it wasn't long before they opted for a consistent leader by sending him to Detroit for Chauncey Billups. In Detroit where he was supposed to have been traded back in 2001, same story, couldn't accept his diminishing role feuded with the coach, and eventually landed in Memphis where he was able to convince the staff that he was ready to do whatever he needed to fit into a team. However, three games passed, yes three, and then Iverson's Memphis jersey hit the clearance rack when it was clear that he would not honor what he'd said, and after a heartfelt return to the Sixers in 2010, he played 25 more games before an injury pulled a curtain over that season and the remainder of his professional career. In short, Iverson was a great player and even better than Kobe for a few years at the beginning of their careers, but his attitude and life off the court pretty much hampered what was supposed to be a far more illustrious and consistent career. While Kobe and Iverson may both have seemed like immovable objects in terms of attitude, Kobe was a far harder worker and more committed to winning. He even told a story of how he studied how sharks hunt seals so he could guard Iverson. I've never figured out how that worked, but then again, I'm not Kobe, I'm not a professional player, so whatever. In hindsight, the Sixers probably wish they had 20 years of Kobe, but in 96, most teams would have taken Iverson with that first pick. At number 2, the Toronto Raptors selected Marcus Camby who actually turned out to have a long and productive career as a rim protector. He led the NBA four times in blocks per game with the highest average being four in his second season with the Raptors. He was pretty much good for a double-double and great defense for any team he was on, and he's been on some pretty familiar squads. The 99 Knicks that went to the finals, Denver pretty much the whole time they had Carmelo, and then he traveled around as a journeyman until the end of his career with the Knicks in 2013. Oh, and he also nearly killed Jeff Van Gundy with a headbutt while trying to roundhouse punch Danny Ferry, so cool career highlight there. In total, he played 17 seasons for six teams, averaged a double-double with two blocks per game, won Defensive Player of the Year in 2007, and made four all-defensive teams. Definitely one of the better defensive players of the 2000s and not a lousy pick at all. But okay, can I say it now? Damn, this sucks for Toronto. They traded him after year two for Sean Marks, Charles Oakley, and Cash. They didn't even keep their number two pick. Then they went on to draft McGrady the very next year to pair with Vince, so what's to say they couldn't have just tried Kobe and Vince? What if that was Air Canada instead? But you know, I'm just dreaming because Kobe probably would not have blossomed next to Vince just like T-Mac was not unlocked until he left for Orlando. Still, Kobe and Vince sounds like a damn highlight factory, sign me up. The Vancouver Grizzlies selected Sharif Abdur Rahim III, and for the numbers he put up, it's a bit surprising you never hear his name in any kind of retrospect. From 1997 to 2005, he averaged 20 points and 8 rebounds, and definitely put together a solid career so he's not a laughable third pick. In 2002, he even became the 6th youngest player to reach 10,000 points. But if you've never heard of this guy in your life, it's because he really played for like every terrible franchise of the 2000s. The Grizzlies never won more than 23 games while he was there, the Hawks were in no man's land when he went there for two seasons and made his only all-star team, nobody has a clue what the mid-2000s Blazers were about, and then he landed on the Kings near the end of his career where he ended his streak for most games played without a playoff appearance. 
So he didn't have a terrible individual career, but he had next to no success as part of a team and therefore really never played any meaningful basketball in his career. So this is what people refer to in the modern day as a player posting empty stats, which would also help explain why he's never been discussed. Speaking of discussing or disgusting, I don't even want to imagine Kobe's career starting in Vancouver. That might have really forced him to the Italian league. Milwaukee and Minnesota can be done at the same time, seeing as they literally swapped guards as opposed to taking Kobe Bryant. Neither were bad choices at the time, by the way. The Bucks took Stefan Marbury at number 4 and traded him for the 5th pick in Ray Allen. Obviously, if you watched my Kevin Garnett video from a few weeks ago, then you already know the Bucks pretty much won that trade. Marbury had tons of potential, but couldn't deal with making so much less money and having so much less star power than Garnett. So that duo broke up very early on in his lifespan. And while he was a good scorer and a good player for most of his career, leaving KG was a really bad idea from a success standpoint, as none of the other teams he was a part of went anywhere and he was out of the league by the time he was 31. That had a lot to do with his time in New York basically destroying his reputation. Public spats with coaches Larry Brown and Isaiah Thomas, season ending surgery that the team said was unnecessary, tons of money on his contract that made him unattractive to potential suitors, yeah things really couldn't have gone much worse, which is why he opted to spend the rest of his playing days becoming a legend in China. Throughout his prime years, he was good for around 22 points and 8 assists, so with a better attitude, there's no doubt that he could have been something special in Minnesota. Ray Allen's career however was the total opposite. Things probably could have gone better faster if the Wolves kept him with KG, but it didn't turn out too shabby. 10 time all star, multiple NBA championships, most 3 pointers made in history, greatest shot in NBA history, renowned as the greatest shooter of all time until around 2016. Allen actually wound up with the most successful career out of anyone drafted before Bryant. Teams just didn't make the most of him while they had him early on. In particular, the Sonics had him for a lot of his prime, and it's insane to think that they easily could have paired him with Kevin Durant if they didn't trade him to the Celtics. As a matter of fact, he says in his book that he didn't expect to be traded. He'd sat down with the new ownership to discuss the team, and he was apparently led to believe that he was a part of the future. Little did he know that he'd be sent to Boston on the exact same night they drafted Durant, and he was mad that he had to find out about it through the media instead of their conversation. But no matter, it would go on to make him a champion. Both the Sonics and the Bucks had failed to be consistent, legitimate contenders with him, so in the end, it was best for everyone that he moved on, especially because the Sonics went on to get Westbrook to put with Durant, and I highly doubt that their plan was to have Durant playing with Rashard Lewis and Ray Allen, they just wanted to really rebuild. That leaves us with the Bucks and Wolves who both missed out on Kobe. The Bucks didn't really have some megastar that needed a partner. The Wolves however missed out on pairing KG with Brian. Things get complicated here because part of the reason Kobe didn't break out right away was being on a stacked Lakers squad. However, he might have been perfect next to Kevin Garnett. I always love to imagine Garnett's potential trade to the Lakers in 07, but damn. Imagine these two basically starting their careers together. We never get the cool shit, man. And for the final pick of the Super 6, Antoine Walker. You ever seen that picture of Kobe working out for Boston? Well, it was a lot closer to happening than you might have originally thought. Red Auerbach was just as impressed with Kobe Bryant as Jerry West was, ML Carr was wowed by his basketball knowledge in their interview, there literally wasn't anything wrong with Kobe in their eyes and they spotted right away that he was going to become a great player. Become being the key word there. The reality was that the Celtics had actually traded up to draft in the Super 6. Antoine Walker was the only one left by that point and they believed he would immediately help the team whereas Kobe would take time they didn't have to become what they'd need. But man, they were in love with him during their workout. And in some alternate universe, Kobe did 20 in green instead of purple and gold. Meanwhile, in the version of history we got, Walker did turn out to be a good player for around 10 years, just not the franchise altering one the Celtics needed. In his prime years with Boston, he averaged 21 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals, but he was pretty inefficient shooting only 41% over that stretch. Nevertheless, both he and Pierce led the Celtics to the conference finals in 02 when they hadn't even made the playoffs since 95. Shortly afterwards, he was shipped to the Mavericks where he fills it out a bit due to their roster makeup. As it turned out, Boston would be the highlight stretch of his individual career and through being moved around a couple of more times, 
He wound up in Miami's title team in 06, which was fortunate, but unfortunately, that basically spelled the end of his career as he was out of the league by 31 years old. Things worked out for the Celtics as they chose Pierce to lead them into the future, but I'll never not wonder how a Kobe Bryant career in Boston would have turned out. And honestly, now that we're out of the Super 6 of 96, we can wrap the rest of this up rather quickly because there's a massive drop off. Lorenzen Wright was taken 7th by the Clippers who would have never managed Kobe Bryant's career right with Donald Sterling at the helm. And Wright is probably more known for what happened after his playing days where he was mostly a role player. The big man played 13 seasons bouncing around to 5 different teams. And very shortly after his last game in 2009, he was found shot to death in the summer of 2010. It's a very sad story that was only ever solved just a couple of years ago. And for that, I invite you to find some videos on this site about it because it's very outside of the scope of this video. In light of being shunned by Brian's agent, New Jersey took Kerry Kittles instead with the 8th pick and they probably got the best player out of the final 6 chosen before Kobe. Kittles was a decent scorer with a nice 3 point stroke, but the wheels came off of his career due to injury. First was a knee that shut him down for the entirety of the 2001 season, and then a degenerative disc in his back put him away permanently in 2005, meaning his career lasted only 8 seasons. The Nets might be hurting the most out of any team that messed out on Kobe because they truly did want him. Jerry West just has his ways man. At number 9? Things only got worse as Dallas selected big man Samaki Walker who played 10 seasons for 6 teams as a role player. The hilarious part about this is that he became the Lakers role player during their final title run with Shaq in 2002. That's probably the highlight of his career as he was able to back up O'Neal at times and walked away with a ring. And a black eye. Yeah. Kobe of all people punched Walker in the face because he didn't have his $100 after a bet the team made on a half court shot game. Getting drafted before, completely outshined by and punched in the eye by Kobe is a hell of a triple threat. Those dudes were just star crossed or something. The Mavericks managed to finesse Dirk Nowitzki two years later and I don't think anybody in Dallas has been fawning over a Kobe what if. Eric Dampier was taken at the 10th spot by the Pacers where he played exactly one season before being traded in a deal for Chris Mullen. Of course, Indiana was still in the Reggie Miller era at the time trying to contend, so high school Kobe made little sense to them. Still, considering they'd lose to him in the finals four years later and enter a gruesome rebuilding stage throughout the 2000s after the malice at the palace destroyed that core, maybe they wish they would have taken him instead. Dampier was a solid big man throughout the 2000s, and you probably know him mostly from being a part of the Dallas team in the 06 finals and making a short stop in Miami with their big three before the end of his career. But just saying Eric Dampier was drafted before Kobe Bryant out loud, I mean, I get why it happened, but <laughs> wow. At 11, Golden State took Todd, no profile picture on basketball reference Fuller. Good lord, man. Fuller played 5 seasons with the Warriors and never played in the NBA again. He averaged 4 points and 3 rebounds as a center, and yeah, his senior year in college where he was putting up 20 and 10 just really fooled the Warriors. About the only positive thing about them not taking Kobe Bryant is that they now have the most unbeatable dynasty in NBA history. You know, butterfly effect and stuff. If they draft Kobe, they probably end up much better throughout the 2000s. Change one thing, another thing doesn't happen, bam. Warriors never get Steph Curry. If anything, Warriors can write Todd Fuller a thank you note. And finally, imaginary drum roll for the players selected before Kobe Bryant who surprisingly is never brought up. Big man Vitaly, also no picture on basketball reference Potapinko. A guy who lasted way too long in the league as Kobe's predecessor to never be mentioned. He played 10 full seasons for 4 different teams before bowing out of the league in 2007. And you'd be astonished by how much information there isn't floating around about the player drafted before Kobe Bryant. He averaged around 6 points and 4 rebounds, and there's literally nothing else notable that happened in his career. Kind of underwhelming for Kobe's preceding pick. I'd prefer Samaki Walker in this spot. Makes for a far better story. The Cavaliers obviously missed out on a generational talent, but they had their own special in the works for the 2000s, and I highly doubt that Kobe's agent would have allowed them to take him. So as you can see in the last half of this video, after we got out of the Super 6, there wasn't much justification for choosing any of these guys over Kobe except that he was a high school kid. In total, only two players on this list had a career where you could even think that it was justified to take them before Kobe. And that just goes to show how much pressure is on these teams in the draft. You could end up with Kobe Bryant, or you could end up with a guy that gets punched by Kobe Bryant, and you really have no assurance on which is the correct choice in real time. 
But still, Kobe was a super talent in high school, and any team that at least gave him the time to show what he could do instantly came to know what he was about. It seems kind of foolish that nobody else acted on it, but that also raises the question of who else Bryant's camp would have shunned after Jerry West set his plan in motion. His plan gave us Kobe and Shaq, 20 years of Kobe in LA, and countless unforgettable moments. And all things considered, there wasn't a better place for the career of an all-time great to blossom. 